So we're gonna write this cosecant inverse x derivative is, so it's either going to be what we have up here without the absolute value around x or negative what we have here, depending on if x is positive or negative. And I'll go with the negative one first, or the regular one first, although it's weird it will have a negative sign because our original had that negative sign already in it. So if I just delete the absolute value around the x, that'll be the first version. And the second version is negative this, which actually looks like positive 1 over x square root x squared minus 1. So I didn't do anything other than rewrite it without the absolute value sign. The first one, I just erased the absolute value sign around x. And the second one, technically I made it negative. I took, it was already had a negative sign, so I just made it, I canceled that negative sign out. All right, the first one, we just deleted the absolute value, so we assumed x was positive. So I could write greater than zero, except what do I also have to pay attention to? The one, the negative one. So not only does that have to be positive, it has to be greater than one because that's, our square root will get messed up if x is uh, like one half or even one. So we can take care of both of these at the same time just by writing x is greater than one. So it's both positive and bigger than one. And the other one is the opposite, not just x less than zero, but less than negative one. So whichever version you'd like, go with that version. Doesn't matter. One of them will save a little space, and the other one uh, might be easier to work with. And for every derivative, you get a free antiderivative. So we're going to move the derivative operator to the other side as an inverse. So the antiderivative of this ugly expression is basically cosecant inverse. So we'll write that down here. Antiderivative, we're going to write a u instead of x. And we're also allowed to move the absolute value to the other side. Right. Oh, we did this for secant inverse, didn't we? Ah, yes. So we just did an antiderivative for secant inverse, and it looks almost exactly the same. You can see at the top of the page, I'll zoom in a tiny bit more. So the top of the page is the antiderivative for uh, a form that's almost exactly the same. It's just negative of what we have. So we're just going to go with the top version here. We're not going to do another uh, cosecant antiderivative. So forget about the cosecant <laughs> antiderivative. We'll just go with the uh, secant inverse antiderivative above. So we get no useful antiderivative here. So I th think we're pretty much done with the theory of this section and we're into the example problems now. <coughs> so we've gotten through the heavy lifting and now we're just going to do a bunch of examples. So we're going to apply everything that we have written down to these problems. So our first example, and of course the example problems are going to be similar to what you see on your midterm and quiz. So one of the first things you can do with this form is rewrite it so it looks like 1 over this square root. And then just move the dx out there. So I like to keep my dx separate off to the right instead of as a numerator. What form does this 
this look like? It doesn't really look like that cosecant inverse antiderivative because it would need an extra, basically an extra x hanging around. It doesn't have that. It does have the square root. So there is five, well really, it's not this one. So there's only a few antiderivatives we have written. Hopefully it looks, it's definitely not code, or definitely not tangent because that doesn't have a square root. So it's definitely not the tangent. So that's out. Here we go. Sine inverse. So let's write down this. I'm going to rewrite this. So we're going to be using, let's see if I can remember it, 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du equals sine. This is the sine inverse u plus c. Was there an absolute value on that? Just sign inverse you. All right, did I write that down correctly? There is? No, there isn't. Isn't? Okay, so it's written correctly. All right, there's a couple problems. What are some of the issues preventing me from using this? There's a stupid three and a stupid four. So let's deal with a 3 first. How do you turn a 3 into a 1? Divide by 3. Could divide by 3. You can also factor out a 3. Those are the two reasonable ways to do it. So let's factor out a 3. So I factored a 3 out. You have to force that out of the second term because there's no 3 to really factor out. So you just divide by 3. And then this is 1 over square root 3. <coughs> so we are one step closer. What is the next problem that we have to deal with? That four thirds. Now, if I do the same trick and try to factor out four thirds, I'll screw up the one. So I can't just factor out four thirds out. My one will disappear. It'll turn into three fourths. So I can't do that same trick. So let's rewrite this term right here as just one thing squared. So it's going to look like one minus. What term can I put in here so it's the same thing? U. At some point it will be a u, but before we make that substitution. So it definitely needs a single x or coefficient. Two over square root three is coefficient it needs. So we just took 4 thirds x squared and basically square rooted it, and then wrote it as that square root squared. So any algebra questions on what I just did? You could call this factoring out the square. That would be one way to think about it. I'm just writing as one thing squared so it looks like the right form. Unfortunately. That stupid 2 over square root 3 is still there. Algebraically, there's really nothing else I can do. This is as good as it gets. What calculus trick do you know that you might be able to turn that into something else? U substitution. So what's a good choice for you? 2 over square root 3 x? Yep. So this term right there, that's going to be u. And then it'll be 1 over 1 minus u squared square root. It'll be in exactly the right form. Is 
So we're going to let u equal 2 over square root 3x, du equals 2 over square root 3 dx. I have a 1 over square root 3 dx. I don't have a 2 over square root 3 dx. So let's get the 2 to the other side. 1 half du is 1 over square root 3 dx. I don't need to move the square root 3 out because I have it already. So when I make my u sub, what I just circled is what I'm subbing out. So we get a 1 half integral 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du. And now, this is 1 half times sine inverse u, right there, plus c. <laughs> so we're finally in the right form, and I can apply this antiderivative. And remember to unsubstitute u, so it's sine inverse 2 over square root 3x. And that is our answer. We're finally back into x's. We got rid of the antiderivative by antidifferentiating. OK, questions on our algebra, the use of? On this one, the actual calculus part was super easy. The algebra was the trickiest part, in my opinion. Anybody have their textbook here? They got some better forms that I'm going to write down for you, slightly better forms that do a little algebra. Can you pass that textbook up here? So I think they're actually up in the beginning of chapter 8. I want to put you to the best place to look. So I know there's a lot of beginning of chapter 8, and I think that's Yep, we'll go with, well, they use x's, not u's. Let me see what they do in 7, 6. So here's the table I want. This is page 411, table 7.4. Table 7.4. So I'm going to write down the three antiderivatives. 4.11? Yeah. Um, so we have the antiderivative. I'm going to copy it right out of the table. They write the du on top instead of writing a 1 and a du next to it. This is going to be the sine inverse, sine inverse u, except this one is sine inverse u over a plus c. The next one is a tangent inverse. Last one will be a secant inverse, du over u square root, u squared minus a squared equals 1 over a. Seek inverse, absolute value u over a plus c. And I missed a 1. There's In the second one, there's also 1 over a in front of tangent inverse. I strongly recommend that you use these three as your antiderivative forms. 
they're a little bit more flexible, a doesn't have to equal 1. When a equals 1, this is exactly what we wrote down. So let's redo our last problem, except we'll use, let's see, we need the sign inverse. We'll use this third one right here. So we're going to redo the last antiderivative, but use the third, uh, well, not the third, the first antiderivative here. So we're going to redo integral. Let's see, let me pass that back. Thanks. So we're going to redo integral dx over square root 3 minus 4x squared. So first thing we need to do is write negative 4x squared as negative 2x whole thing squared. Now, if I leave this as 3, this won't be in the right form, because if I look at the form I'm trying to go for, I see it's not just a, but it's a squared. So how do I write 3 as something squared? So it'll be square root of, yeah, so it'll be the square root of 3 squared like that. So that's how we're going to do this. So from here, you do need to make a u sub. What u sub needs to be made? 2x. You got 2x, so du 2dx. We don't have a 2dx, we just have a dx. du. And what does a equal? a is going to be square root, almost. a will be just the square root 3, so it'll look like the a squared in the right form. So we're going to go and make all these subs now. So we're going to have, so we're going to get a 1 half as well. du over square root. You could leave it as square root 3 squared, or you can write a squared. It's up to you. Whatever feels better for you, go for that. If you're going to write in a, you better tell me somewhere what a is. So don't just, if you just go with this, I will know what you mean, but I'll probably take a point off because you just wrote in A and never told me what A was. So go ahead and finish this off, unsubstitute, <coughs> and, or anti-differentiate, unsubstitute, and make sure you get the same thing you got the first time. So keep going here. Should have been two relatively easy steps. Uh-oh. Oh, just be a moment. Don't worry. I'm sure it's not important. Good thing we're not doing anything right now. We're just chilling. Oh. Okay, so if you look at your paper, do, are they equal? Yep. Okay. So <laughs> your next problem. Your next problem is antiderivative of dx. Oh, I can't say all. All right, well, I'll do the next one. That one's really tricky. Oh, 
It's a really good Microsoft advertisement. Doing something important? <laughs> Time to wait. <laughs> At least it teaches you patience. There is an X up there. There is an X up there. Oh. <laughs> oh, it tricked us. <laughs> If I write quickly, we can have little 10 second periods of time where I can write. So this is antiderivative dx over e raised to the 2x to the 2x power is power minus 6. All right. So unfortunately, this could be either the first or the last form. How do I know it's not going to be the second form there? <coughs> yep, exactly. There's no square root. It's not added. So it's not going to be that third one. Uh, this is awkward. It doesn't usually happen. Let's use Microsoft products. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was asking Microsoft for help earlier this morning. That was probably a bad choice. <laughs> All right, well, none of those have e to the 2x in them, that's for sure. So we're going to have to get out of e to the 2x somehow. So how do we get rid of e to the 2x? There's not really too many algebra tricks we can do. Square root it. So it sounds like a u sub. If we write the first one, then have our a b square root. <laughs> All right, so first step, e to the 2. I'm going to write that as e to the x squared, because powers of powers are products of powers. So e to the 2x is e to the x squared. We really only have a shot. If you look at the ordering, this is the constant second, not the constant first in the subtraction. So it's not going to be the first one up here. If we have any shot, it's going to be the last one. But what do I need to do before I even attempt to make it look like the last one? I have to get that e to the x out of here. So will you take an ln of it? So if I take an ln, I have to also take an ln inverse. Yeah. So I can't. So we're going to go with the u sub here. And we're going to let u equal e to the x, not e to the x squared, or e to the 2x, because I want this to be u squared. I want this to become a u squared. <laughs> e to the x, what is du? e to the x, dx. And what is a? Not quite 6. Square root 6. So it's going to be what you're looking at is a squared, not a. All right, I want you to try to unsubstitute this. And I'm going to give you a hint e to the x is u. You're going to use that more than once. So I'm putting an extra circle around it. So go ahead and make your substitution. If you're mixing x's and u's, just remember e to the x is u. And I'm going to see if I can fix what's going on.
So that one extra one over u or one over e to the x turns into a one over u. And then that becomes the u that we actually needed for this form. So that was a little bit tricky. That u wasn't really there before, and then we made our substitution and it all of a sudden appeared there. So now we're ready to go tan no secant inverse right here. So this is perfect form for secant inverse, the upper left. One right there. So go ahead and apply that. We get one over a seek inverse absolute value u over a plus c and rewriting all the unsubstituting everything we have here one over square root six seek inverse e to the x over square root six plus c. Questions before we go to the next problem. So I consider that problem, that, that last problem, is a little bit different than the u sub you won't be used to because you had a u all of a sudden appear. And this is the last problem of the section. So if we have any chance at integrating this, it's going to be a tangent inverse. How do I know right away that it's going to be a tangent inverse and not the other two? There's no square root, so it can't be the other two. So let's rewrite the form that we want. So I'm going to rewrite that second one, du over a squared plus u squared. Square root. This is a, u, a squared plus u squared. U equals tan. Yeah, one over a tan inverse. Is there absolute value on the tangent? No. No. All right. So just tangent inverse u over a. All right. What is in our way? What is preventing us from using this? Two. No, the two is not real. I mean, you can say in this form. 2 is almost a squared, that's not the problem. It's that 4x. If I erase that 4x, I could basically say u is 2x, and a is square root 2. But you can't just cross out 4x because it's not convenient. Well, not in my class, you can't. How do we go through and turn x squared, uh, 4x squared plus 4x into something with just an x uh, by itself squared. Factor. Not quite factoring. Well, if we were lucky, this would factor, but I don't think it'll factor that nicely. I could factor a 2 out. Can we factor an x out? No, that wouldn't look. So remember, this is the form we're trying to go to. So I'm going to turn this into an expression. With just an x, just a single x, not <coughs> x appearing two places. So you remember completing the square? Hopefully, we're going to complete the square right here. So step one, factor the 4 out. So completing the square, you take half of the co the second coefficient. So the second coefficient is 1. So we're going to take x plus half of that, which is 1 half. S square that minus 1 half squared. 
So what in the world are we doing? This is just complete the square. So I'll rewrite complete the square. I don't think I've written it this quarter. So completing the square. So in the x squared plus bx form, it looks like x plus b over 2 squared minus b over 2 squared. And I'll foil out the right side to show you why it's true. So on the right side, we get x squared plus b over 2x plus b over 2x. So you get outside, inside, which will be plus bx plus b over 2 squared. That's the second term squared minus b over 2 squared. So that b over 2 squared cancels the minus b over 2 squared. And you get x squared plus bx. So this is completing the square. That may need to go on your cheat sheet, depending on your algebra uh, skills at this point, how long it's been since you had to complete the square. I know we did a lot in calc pre-cal 1 and a little in calculus. So all I did was complete the square, except b was 1. So it looks like things got a lot uglier. So let's see if we can make them look a little nicer. So I'm going to distribute the 4 to the two terms inside. So 4 times a half squared is 1. So that's going to be minus 1 plus 2. So 4 is 2 squared. Plus 1. And we are almost there. You can take that 2 squared if you want to and uh, multiply it inside. It's in tight. just distributed that to, because they're both squared, the property I used right here is this one right here, when n was 2. So I just multiplied right there the 2 squared times the x plus 1 half squared. So I multiplied together, they both have the same power, so I just multiplied the insides. All right, algebra questions. I haven't done any calculus yet. This is just a lot of algebra. No algebra questions? And I wouldn't, I would say that these steps I took here were not obvious. Individually not difficult, but why would I actually do them in this order is not terribly obvious. Uh, this is stuff from probably Algebra 2 class, so the, actual, actu the algebra steps themselves are not difficult, it's just knowing to perform them in this order. All right, we're ready for our U sub. What does U equal? Yep, so we want U squared plus A squared. So we're going to go 2x plus 1 is U, du, 2, dx. So multiply by a half, 1 half du equals dx. Go ahead, make the substitution, anti-differentiate, unsubstitute.
the one half? Uh-oh. So I just forgot it. Yeah, that should be a one half. And there's the one over A, which will be one over one. So yes, you should at the end have one half. Any calculus questions after those calculus steps? So that's the end of 7.6. I definitely cannot put that on your quiz tomorrow. So your quiz tomorrow is 7.5 and everything before. And you may want to look at your take home quiz, which is still online. I probably won't repeat types of questions from that. So I think that ended, I don't know if I did low I don't think I did low towels on your quiz. I can't, I did have exponential logarithmic functions on there, but I don't think I did seven, did I do seven four? No, I think you did. Oh yeah, there was one. I did put one, so, okay. So quiz most likely is gonna be seven five focused. to look at hyperbolic functions now. So let's really quickly review regular trig functions first. So a trig can be pretty much be summed up in cos theta, sine theta are the x, y values of a point on the circle where that's theta. And this gave us cos, cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals one because our uh, circle had the equation x squared plus y squared equals one. So our cosine was x, sine was y, and that's how we got that identity. All right, so that was the Pythagorean identity in trig functions. There's plenty of other things we did in trig, but this was the foundation, one of the starting points here. Was you're on a unit circle, that's what it means to be on a unit circle, and here's cosine and sine, you get that identity right away. So we're in hyperbolic trig now. So it won't be clear why these are called trig functions for a little while. At some point, uh, it'll make a little bit more sense. Mostly they're due to the calculus properties these functions have are one of the main reasons that they behave like regular trig functions. There's a few other properties that are similar too. These functions are all based off of, you could call the regular trig function circular trig. So I could call them circular trig functions because they're based on a circle. What do you think hyperbolic trig functions are based off of? Almost. Hyperbolic. So they're based off a of hyperbola. So it looks a little like a parabola. It has a slightly different curve to it. So there is a hyperbola right here. And our point on here, so the hyperbolic 
uh, equation we're going to use is x squared minus y squared equals 1. So it's not x squared plus y squared equals 1, but this hyperbola, the equation is x squared minus y squared equals 1. Now technically, if you graph this out, there's also a second part of this graph, which I'm not going to use, and it is the other side of the hyperbola. We're not going to use that part at all, so I'm not going to bother drawing that in here. So technically, hyperbolas have two sides to them. And we're not going to worry about the other side. Our, uh, so one of the two coordinates will always be positive. Which coordinate will always be positive? X will always be positive for us. So yes, that is right away, you can tell one of these functions is going to be positive, always. Uh, the other problem we run into is there's no nice sort of measurement for an angle to say where we are on this curve. So before, we just had this spinny angle thing that told us, hey, you rotate this much, and you're going to be right over here on the circle. So I have to have something slightly different. I'm going to just use the letter U, not tell you what it is, for another couple minutes. So. Well, it's going to be a variable. Um, it's going to work a little bit. It's not what it is not. It is not this measurement of the angle right here. Actually, I, that, that may not be true. Mm. I haven't actually thought much about what U is. So this, and for the x, we're going to go with a cosine. I can't just write cosine u because cosine u is already in use by the cosine function that we're used to. So I have to give it a new name. We're not going to be very creative. We're just going to write an h at the end, cos h of u. So this is for the hyperbolic cosine. will be cosine h. So that h at the end, I'll write it in green so you pay extra attention. That h means hyperbolic cosine. And of course, the y value, sine h of u. So we just put a little extra letter at the end of the regular trig function. So cos h u is, the function is cos h, and the input is u. So this means hyper, hyperbolic cosine of u. And there's a way to pronounce these. I'm drawing a blank at the moment. I think they're cosh and cinch. Cinch. Is that, you open up your book, I think they have the pronunciations in there. <laughs> oh. You know this is going to be interesting when we have to get to pronunciation. So I think posh, kosh, kosher, there we go. Kosher, is that? Kosher. You just obviously don't put the ER at the end. Um. Pronounced cinch, C I N C H. Cinch. What, what do they write for the kosher pronounce? They don't use kosher minus the ER. No, they basically did that. Okay. They say anything about tanch. <laughs> it sounds really bad. <laughs> like we're forcing the <laughs> language to work. That means seeksh. And because you can't even say the last one. Cosage. <laughs> All right, I will probably just say cosage. If we know we're working with hyperbolic, I'll probably just say cos. And you just know in this problem it's hyperbolic instead of regular. So let's not make a big deal about the way they're pronounced. <laughs> and then we don't have to make fun of ourselves for mispronouncing them. <laughs> All right, so the one identity we get from here is that cos, cosh, 
squared u minus sine cinch squared u equals 1. So there's our basic identity. So any hyperbolic trig function, cosh and cinch, need to have this property. So tomorrow we'll officially define what is cosine hyperbolic and what is sine hyperbolic.